So if you're joining us, we're going to be in the book of Philemon, book of Philemon. So if you turn there with me, I've got a great word from that epistle. We're, we are starting a brand new series. Maybe you noticed that from the artwork, our theme park series. You know, it's only three days until spring. Can you believe that? Hallelujah. Amen. We need some spring in our lives. Uh, and what spring usually reminds me of is that vacations are right around the corner. School year is starting to slowly begin to wind down, and we're already thinking about where we might go and what we might do. So I thought it would be fun to do a theme park series, um, capitalizing on popular Disney and Universal movies, where we might see a connection in the biblical text that's selected each week. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Um, for week one... I need to apologize in advance if this message gets a particular song stuck in your head. I've entitled the message this morning, It's a Small World. It's a small world. Because isn't it a small world after all? It surely is. I was reading an article on Yahoo, and it was a great article that was written, which is kind of caught me off guard because a lot of the writing nowadays isn't, isn't super good. I just want to get articles out there very quick. But well-written article. And I want to know who is this, this author that would, would, would write so eloquently and, and just really capture, I think, a, 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 um, an event. It just would document in such uh, precision and just, with, just um, remarkable. So what I did is I, I actually Googled the author's name. I wanted to learn more about this, this author. And maybe they have some other writings that I might enjoy. The thing that I found, which really blew me away, is I actually found their Facebook page. And so I went on their Facebook page, and what I love about Facebook is it shows you if you have any shared or common friends. And I found that I actually had a common friend with this author that I've never met before. And it got me to think, it's a small world after all. Somebody that is on the other side of the United States I've never met, we have a common friend. I thought that was pretty cool. So we'll be reminded of just how small a world it really is as we look at the book of Philemon. And uh, as you're turning there, I want to give you some background on what is happening in this epistle. Uh, Paul is writing this letter from jail. He's writing to a friend of his. His friend's name is what the name of the, the letter is, Philemon. Uh, and so he writes it from jail uh, to this friend who lives in uh, Colossae, and he's writing it because there is a slave named Onesimus who's escaped his owner, Philemon, and he is on the run. He has escaped, and he's gone to Rome to try to blend in. Now, Rome is where Paul is in prison. Onesimus will actually uh, visit him while he's in prison. And the whole thought process that Onesimus has is he hopes that when he gets to Rome, since he's a slave and everybody knows him in Colossae, is that he'll just blend in. Rome at this time had a population of over a million people. So it'd be easy to not get noticed. But he goes to this large city and... Lo and behold, he runs into somebody that he knows. He runs into Paul. So let's get into verse 1. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Uh, and what that is saying, that is, he's in chains for the gospel. And Timothy, our brother. Now you might notice that this is a similar address that Paul will have in his other letters, but it's, it, there's a variation here. It's not exactly the same. You see, when Paul would write from prison uh, to the church at Philippi, he would mention Timothy too. He would talk about Timothy in the introduction of the letter. Uh, he would say, uh, and the reason for it is different. He'd mention Timothy to the church at Philippi because Timothy helped start that church, and Paul has a plan in mind. Paul is going to send Timothy back to visit them shortly. So right away, Paul says, uh, Paul and Timothy... But here, why in the world would Paul mention Timothy? Because, to tell you the truth, uh, the Colossian church, church at Colossae, um, is way different. This is the one that Philemon belongs to. It's different in the fact that Paul didn't start this church. Timothy didn't start this church. They indirectly did. 
Uh, we know that there's a guy by the name of Epaphras uh, who heard the gospel that Paul would preach. And not only would he get saved, but Paul would train him up. And Paul would say, you need to go back to your hometown in Col Colossae and you need to plant a church there. I've already trained you. You have what you need. You're ready, Epaphras. So he sends them and the church starts indirectly from Paul, but it's the work of Epaphras. Uh, and you find that in Colossians uh, 1, 7 and also 4.12. I'm not just spitballing here. It's actually documented in the Word of God. So what is the point? Why does Paul mention Timothy in the beginning of this letter? Is the suspense killing you? You really want to know why in the world would he do such a thing? Because they didn't necessarily even know Timothy or know him very well. We find our answer in the Greek uh, as to why Paul would mention him. There is a word there, uh, and the word it, that you'll see, it says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. Now, in the English, you're going, yeah, what's the big deal? And, and Timothy. Yes, he's introducing him in this letter. The word and in the Greek is, is ho, and what it means, it's got this root word that means in all of their afflictions. So what Paul is saying as he writes this letter is he's in chains. He mentions that in verse 9 and 10. And he's telling Philemon that Timothy is here with me in jail. This isn't an occasion where it's just Paul and Timothy's free and Timothy's doing a lot of the work at the church. They're there in jail together. And he is actually co-authoring this letter with me. That's why he says Paul and Timothy. Uh, because he's saying that we're here together in this, in this shared affliction. And so the way that this letter came about, I said, Pastor Matt, that's a lot of spending on just the word and. A lot of time spent there. Is because I saw it this way. The way that this letter came about through the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of Paul and Timothy is through their shared affliction. Greek word ho, of Paul and Timothy. And what God would do in their shared affliction is he would bring about, we'll find out later in this letter, a healing relationship of two other guys, Philemon and Onesimus. And God, through this shared affliction, God didn't, isn't the, the author of afflicting his people. That's what the enemy did. It's what uh, Pastor Steve mentioned when he alluded to the book of Job earlier. Is that he would form a new partnership between two very unlikely people. Somebody who actually is hurt by somebody else. Somebody who, in fact, uh, whenever their name comes to mind, uh, would label them useless. We'll see that later in the letter. Um, and think that there's no value to this individual at all. But God is going to do something. And he's doing it through Paul and Timothy in their shared affliction. Now, in verse 2, Paul will mention... Two other people, Apple and Archie, it's the English version of their difficult names to pronounce. Um, Paul says the Greek word chi, which just means also. So Paul is also bringing up two other people, Archie and Apple. I'm mentioning them also. Why in this prison letter where Paul probably doesn't have a lot of resources to write a lot and a lot of time, well, maybe he's got time. I don't know how that all worked, how much time he had when he's in prison in Rome. He probably had some extra privileges since he was a Roman citizen. But he includes, he spends enough time to include two other people. And the reason he does it, I believe, is because what he wants to do is he wants to show Philemon that they have this shared bond, this extra connection. I know Apple and Archie just like you do, and I want to I bring them up for a moment. We, we do this all the time. I, I love this. Um, let's say you're meeting someone uh, that you've never met before. Maybe it's a new business associate, and you, you're gathering together at a coffee house, and, and you're, you're talking shop, and somewhere you get through your agenda, you get through all the stuff that you needed to do, and so you got a little bit of time maybe even start off this way, where you're just going to talk about your, your lives, just briefly. Somewhere along the conversation, he or she mentions that they go to uh, Kensington Church. 
Now, you don't belong to Kensington, but you probably know someone who does. So you might go, hey, by any chance, do you know the Anderson family? I'm sure there's an Anderson family at Kensington. I, I'm sure of it. Uh, not this is just, I'm just throwing a, a random name out there. Do you know the Anderson family? Well, yeah, of course I do. Well, would you tell him I said hello next time you see him? We do that all the time. I don't know why we go with that, because nowadays, when we're at the coffee shop, we could go on Facebook and we could say hi to them right there at that meeting. But we want to we wanna tell them to tell them that I said hello. Um, and, and the reason we do that in our human nature is it's a way of expressing our shared connection. It actually kind of brings us closer to that person that we're communicating in the room with. Because you know the Andersons, and I know the Andersons. Wow, that's a small world, after all. So Paul mentions Apple and Archie. We don't know a lot about uh, Apple, but we do know a lot about Archie. There's historical reference that shed light on both, and I just want to share it briefly because I want you to know a little bit of their story. In Colossians 4.17, Paul requests his readers to tell Archi Ar Archisippus, see to it that you complete the ministry that you've received from the Lord. Apparently, Archie is a young man from Colossae, and he's tasked with leading uh, a ministry in the church. We know that he's got ministerial responsibilities. So right away, when Paul mentions Archie and Apple, you can trace throughout the historical accounts that all three of these people belong to the same church. They all belong to the, the Colossian church. That is why he's writing this to Philemon. I know these two. They go to your church. Um, what you might not know about them if you were to have gone on Yahoo's homepage in 57 AD, you would have seen the headlines. And it read like this. A pagan festival, during a pagan festival, an enraged crowd rushed into the Christian church service that was happening in Colossae. Everyone in the church fled in terror, and only Philemon, Archie, and Apple remained. They seized them, they led them to the city prefect, the crowd beat and stabbed Archie with knives. He died on his way to the courthouse, while Philemon and Apple made it there alive, were then stoned to death by order of the prefect. So there is that. Also, if you study out the history, a few years after this epistle would land in the hands of the leaders of the church, a violent earthquake would take place and would actually decimate the entire city. So why did I bring all of that up? Like, that's a major bummer. Like, your church leaders were executed, and also an earthquake has ruined the city. Oh, by the way, Apple, they believe, is probably Philemon's wife, if you're wondering about her. That's what legend says. We don't know for sure, but high probability. The reason I brought that up is because even knowing the tragedies that would take place, Paul doesn't know about that when he writes this. The death of a few saints and a natural disaster did not, nor will it ever, destroy the church. Because the church isn't, isn't, uh, isn't a few people. The church is many members. And it's not a physical location. And so tragedies can strike, but the tragedies and the persecutions and the various things that would happen would actually, God would actually use those things as people spread out. They no longer were able to gather in one central place. They had to go, and as they went and found a new hometown and found a new area, new opportunities presented themselves to share the gospel. And it was all part of, I have to tell you, it was all part of the spread of Christianity, that explosion that happened. It all stemmed from all these different things that were going on. And a lot of things were very difficult and, and not pleasant that the early uh, believers went through. Verse 3 says, work my way through this grace and peace to you, Philemon. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Now, if you ever have a chance and you just study the letters of Paul, 
I love doing that because you see the continuity through them all. This is just a common address that Paul makes in verse 3. You ever stop and think, man, Paul must be doing a lot of praying. He really must be. Because every time he writes, he's like, I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for you. And I, and I just, every time I think about you, it just results in me praising God for what he has done in your life. We know that Paul's time in prison was fruitful. Some important letters are written. He wrote more than half of the New Testament. And most of the time he would write, a lot of times, not most of them, a lot of times he'd write because he, he wasn't so busy going from here to there. He was stuck in a cell. And what that communicated to me, there should be some great hope there for us. In those times when we feel boxed in, when we feel something is forcing us to stop actually moving forward, we are moving forward, it might just not feel like it, those times can be the most fruitful and productive times as a result of praying and seeing what God might want to do in it. So don't hit this, what seems like a dead end, or this, this moment of feeling like you're, you're, you're boxed in or you have to stop. Pray about it and see what God is leading you to do. Because this, this epistle, I've got to tell you, is incredible. He says in verse 6, and we're, gonna, we're about to get into the meat of it. I pray that your partnership with us. That word in the Greek is koinonia. And it's a very simple word that has some variances in its definition. The most common way it's used is fellowship. And so when we gather together... Uh, they just, uh, family ministry just went to an interesting Chinese buffet restaurant. Koinonia, you're gathering together, you're fellowshipping together in Christ at, at, at a place near Great Lakes Crossing. It's great. It's, it's, it's wonderful. But it can take on this other definition too where it can mean partnership. Partnership. And this is how it's translated and it's accurate because they are geographically separated. Paul and Philemon, they can't get together face to face. They can't break bread together. It's not the kind of fellowship where we're in the room together and we've got this interaction taking place. No, instead it's a partnership with Philemon and the jail and the enemy and no one else is able to remove because it's a partnership in the faith. It's a shared belief, pistos, that Jesus is the Messiah through whom we have eternal salvation and in entrance into the kingdom of God. Uh, you, the enemy can't take that from us. We might have a lot that's not in common, but we have this partnership together in the faith. Now one thing I've learned about partnership is it has mutual benefits. Verse 6 first is going to mention uh, Philemon's benefits. Because there's something in his life that's going on that Paul can help him with that is going to be an amazing revelation and it's going to change really the trajectory of how he does ministry going forward and how he sees other people. I pray that you, your partnership with us in the faith, your translation may read, may be effective. It's not a good translation. In the Greek, it doesn't mean may be effective. It means may come into existence. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may come into existence. What Paul is trying to bring into existence through his partnership, his shared belief system with Philemon, is that he would view Onesimus no longer as his slave, but in a different way. In just a moment, I'll share that. In deepening, it says, maybe affected in deepening your understanding. Deepening your understanding. May come into existence. It means precise and correct knowledge. It's really the Greek word. What I want to bring forth into existence, into your world, Philemon, Precise and correct knowledge of every good thing which is in you. In humon. And that is the same 
that is in all of us, this good thing that is in all, all of us. But there is a lot of believers who might not have in a certain aspect or, 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 or element of the faith, may not have correct and precise knowledge, and so they're, they're operating in this one area uh, outside of what God's intention is. And that is true in Philemon's interaction with Onesimus. I've come in this partnership I have with you to give you something, correct and precise knowledge about somebody uh, that you feel a certain way about. He says, for the sake of Christ. Uh, that is the major thing that Philemon stands to gain in this partnership with Paul. It's correct and precise knowledge. Now, what does Paul benefit from Philemon? Look at verse 7. Remember I said partnership has, has mutual benefits for both parties. That's how a partnership works. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. What a lovely compliment. Paul is so good at giving good, gracious compliments. Philemon, that thing, that gifting you have, what you've been doing for God's people, I'm going to ask you to do it for two very unlikely people. I'm going to ask you to do it for your former slave, Onesimus. I'm also going to ask you to do it for me as well. Verse 7 would have softened Philemon's heart, because what Paul's asking him to do, he has a history with this guy, Onesimus. It's not an easy ask of what Paul is saying. And so Paul softens his heart by saying, man, Philemon, the one thing that you are so great at, I ask that you'd extend that to the one person that you really don't want to. I love Paul's approach. I've actually put it into my playbook. And I'll share, you how, share how I do it. Uh, Diane, you know how you're such a great cook and you make that fantastic buffalo chicken dip? I was thinking, what better way than to showcase it at our party? The beauty of the gracious, loving approach of Paul is that if he can get buy-in from Philemon, if he can get Philemon to have correct, precise knowledge of what he's going to ask him to do, and to think about Onesimus in a different way. And this is for Philemon's good, as Paul benefits as Onesimus' life back home, because he's on the run, will forever be changed, and the church will be strengthened for what lies ahead. That's why I had to tell you about the pagan festival, and the attacks that's coming, and, and the earthquake, and everything else, because... If you'll receive this guy, Paul doesn't know any of this, but this is through the Holy Spirit. If you'll receive this guy, he's going to be an aid to you, and he's going to be instrumental in how the gospel will be ready to go forward no matter what takes place in that region. Verse 9, Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is none other than Paul, an old man. I love that, because that ties into last week. He's just taking a chapter out of John's playbook. Remember the elder, the old man? Here's Paul. The old man, now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Funny thing happened. Funny thing happened, Philemon. Guess who came in? I came into contact here while I was in jail. You'll never believe it. I'm in Rome. I'm not even thinking of Colossae. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, who walks in? other than your former slave, Onesimus. It's like that time I got an instant messenger picture where the Andrews and the OJ sent me uh, of the Michigan State Northwestern game. And I got the picture, and I'm not up on all things Michigan State football. Uh, I got the picture, and I'm like, oh, isn't that nice? They, they ran into each other in East Lansing. That's pretty cool. Uh, both at the football game. I hope they enjoy it. But then I look closer at the picture, and I'm like, wait a minute. That doesn't look like East Lansing. That, that doesn't look like uh, the, their stadium. And I realized they were in uh, Evanston. Evanston, I think it is. Uh, they were at the Northwestern game, at Northwestern. They ran into each other in a different state. What are the chances? 
what are the chances, Paul says? It's a small world. So I'm writing you, Philemon, and I'm going to wrap this up in a, in a few minutes. But stay with me, because this is really where it starts to show itself. I'm writing to you. This is the reason why God would have me. While I'm in prison in Rome, I'm writing to one person, and it's you. I'm appealing for my son Onesimus, who became my son while in chains. The word son is technion, and it means two, it can be uh, translated two different ways. And Paul uses it twice because he's using both definitions of it. He's saying, uh, first of all, that he became a child of God. Onesimus became a child of God. He believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to tell you that. But I'm also writing to tell you that he's become my disciple as well. I'm teaching him and training him while I am here in Rome in prison. Look at verse 11. Formerly, he was useless to you. You probably read this time and time again, and maybe you never understood. Why would Paul go to such lengths and say useless? This is, this is amazing. Do you know in the, a slave in Roman times how they got their name? There's three ways that a slave would be given a name in the Roman uh, system that dominated this time. The first is the region they came from. So if your name is Britannicus, you're the slave Britannicus. You've come from Britannia. Come from that land. That's how they named you. That's the first way, the region you came from. Second way they named slaves is you could be named in the possessive form of your owner. Caesarius would come, would belong to Caesar. So you would get a possessive form of the person who was your slave owner. That's another way they named slaves. The third way that they named slaves is by uh, a trait, a quality of the slave, a characteristic. For instance, in the Bible, maybe you've heard the name Felix before. Felix simply means the lucky one. So if, if you're named, if you seem to have a lot of luck, uh, they might call you Felix. Now, how did Onesimus get his name? Which of the three ways did it come from? It's actually Onesimus means profitable or useful. He's named after what he supposedly is known for. So I, I don't I don't know how to do this very sensitively. Uh, the marketplace was was a very cruel way. Uh, uh, how slaves were treated was not pleasant. They were auctioned, and there's a lot of, uh, I don't even know how to say this, but anyway, the auctioneer, I'm just going to put it out there as plain as I can, the auctioneer would put a bid on each slave, and so before you we have the useful, profitable one. Do I have any offers on the useful, profitable one? Philemon was the highest bidder. And so what he thought he was getting was maybe the jack-of-all-trades slave that could help him in many areas. A guy who is really useful and will make you extremely profitable. Paul says, formerly, he was useless to you. So it looks like Onesimus was not living up to his name. Philemon, maybe he felt that he was duped at the auction, the auction house in the marketplace. Um, but Onesimus met Christ through Paul in prison, his name for the first time in his life truly fits him. He is useful to the kingdom of God. Paul said he used to not be living up to his name. He was useless to you. And I'm writing to you not to say that he picked up a trade while he's here in Rome, but I'm writing to you not by what Onesimus did to himself, but what happened to him. The word, Paul says, is not Onesimus again. He says that he's become useful, but he doesn't say he's become Onesimus. 
He somehow discovered how he could become handy. No, he uses this other Greek word for useful, which is uh, eucharistos, easy to make use of, useful. It's the same root word where we get uh, the Lord's Supper, communion, from. And so it's God who has made this former slave useful, not as a slave, but now as a son in the kingdom. Verse 15, it says, Perhaps the reason he was separated to you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. That's a word for someone right there. Maybe the separation wasn't for a forever loss, but a forever gain. To have them back forever. You see, when we look back at things that seem to be negative, maybe they are. Maybe that moment is negative. In a lot of ways, hurtful, painful. Like Philemon's thinking of Onesimus. It's like, man, I don't even want to think about this guy. Detrimental. Doesn't make sense. May we do what Paul did. And look back by inserting a perhaps. Go back to that moment that doesn't make sense. Ask God. What was it in that moment that I can learn from or that you want to use going forth into my future? Perhaps this happened so that this might happen. Perhaps this was done so that Onesimus will forever have his life changed and the relationship between you two would change as well. Because if he stayed, he'd always be in this slave master relationship but look at verse 16 no longer as a slave because that's what the cross of Christ does there is no distinction between slave or free Galatians 3:27 slaves were the lowest class of society criminals who were freed had more rights a slave could not have a family a slave could not uh, own property no longer a slave but better than who paired better than Meaning he went from last class to first class. He is your brother now. He's your brother. He is a child of God. So I want you, Philemon, to do something that is only possible to do for somebody who is in Christ. I no longer want you to treat him as lesser class than you. And that's not an easy thing to ask anyone to do, especially... Someone who has been labeled as fill in the blank for so long. When they come to know Jesus, this is the key. When they come to know Jesus, the old labels don't apply anymore. Don't try to attach old labels to someone Christ has redeemed. And so what Paul is saying, my desire, Philemon, is that you treat Onesimus as he truly is. He's your blood brother. Because the way you treat your blood brother, uh, the way you treat your blood brother is supposed to be way different than you treat someone who's a stranger. So the working relationship will change. It's not a master-slave arrangement, but a partnership now in faith. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you welcome me, Paul says. Verse 17 is going to make this arrangement clear. I want a partnership between you two like you have with me. Verse 6, the partnership uh, that he talks about in verse 6, the partnership God was establishing between an ex-slave and his former master. Now, Onesimus, no, I don't have that in the notes. This is a, no, this is a bonus. Onesimus ran from his situation in search of freedom. He ran from it. He thought, I can, I can make a way for me to find a new life. He found that his true freedom wouldn't be found in running from his past. His true freedom would be found in a God-ordained moment in his present, a prison encounter with Paul and Timothy. And as Onesimus received the love of God through Jesus, he found freedom from slavery of sin, Adoption into the family of God and brotherhood with his former slave owner. Freedom is only found in Christ. It's not found in an escape 
plan in Rome. I mean, God used that, but it wasn't until he received Christ that he found the freedom he was after. Look at verse 18. If he's done, any, done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Put it on my tab. I like to use that one with my kids. Every time we're at the supermarket, heading down, let's say, the juice aisle. Can we please have that super expensive juice box, Daddy? That's not what they say. But that's what I see when it has a Disney character on it. <laughs> I see the Meyer brand. It's a lot cheaper. Please, Dad, I really want the Moana juice because it tastes so much better. Every once in a while, I'll be like, all right, I'm going to have to put it on your tab. <laughs> They know I'm only kidding. Don't have a running tab. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. Verse 18. I'll pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. That's what brotherly Christian love looks like. Paul gave freely to Philemon. So he expects Philemon to freely give to Onesimus. But even if he's not at that point spiritually in his life, where Christ has cultivated this fruit of generosity through him. Paul is willing to pay whatever debt Onesimus owes. And this is the conclusion. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Verse 20. Refresh my heart in Christ. Humility on display. What Paul says is, I need you to do something for me, Philemon. Refresh my heart in Christ. Anapo. Anapo. To give rest, refresh, to give oneself rest, to take rest is what it means. What you're good at, Philemon, verse 5, is the thing I'm going to ask you to give to me. And that is you've been able to help other believers able to enter into Christ's rest through your exhortation, through your uh, encouragement. So quite possibly, Philemon was a pastor at Colossae, especially with him staying there when everyone else fled at uh, Colossae. Paul's concern is for Onesimus and how he'll be received. And so Philemon, what he can do is he can help Paul rest in Christ by assuring him that uh, Philemon will handle the relationship with Onesimus the way that Paul desires. You don't have to worry about it, Paul. I'm going to receive him and treat him as he truly is, a brother in Christ. Christ. So the letter ends PS or PSS. I don't know how many PSs Paul put in there. Prepare a room for me. Because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Closes on verse 23 to 25. Epaphras sends you greetings. That guy, he's a good guy, Pappy. He's making sure to do the rounds. He's a great pastor. Founded the church. In verse 24 it says, not only does Epaphras send you greetings, so does cell block C. Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. I'm kidding, they weren't in prison, but they were on the visitors list that Paul had. He had special privileges because he's a Roman citizen, so he got a lot of visits while he was there. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And why does Paul conclude it that way? Because it's only going to be through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that Philemon will be able to correctly and precisely see Onesimus as he truly is and to treat him as his brother in Christ. Let's bow our heads.